Right, okay, folks, I think we'll miss that. So welcome to our joint session of our seminar between the Oxford Centre for Religion and Culture and the Dialogues Society. Our speaker this week, well, I will let my associate, Professor Paul Weller, introduce him. Just to say that we're slightly working under some fairly constrained circumstances here in that the technology in the room is not working. So this has been done on my laptop. So this is why you can't see me out of sight which is probably not a bad thing, is because I can only point the laptop in one direction at once. And so I figured that it's my important to get the speaker in the chair rather than myself. So I'm this ghostly apparition of sight, bit like Banquo. Um, <laughs> anyway, so it's a delight to have a number of people from the Dialogue Society with us. I know some people have travelled from as far as London to be with us and from other parts of the country. And I think that's testimony to an excellent series that Professor Paul Willow has put together and also to our distinguished speaker, more uh, from him and non. Just to say that, Paul, if you could uh, sort of wave your books and just to remind us that what took, kicked us off are uh, these two excellent books that are, that are best sellers, so I'm told, and, and copies can be purchased via, a, via an electronic link that has been sent out previously by Paul, and we can resend that. And if you're in the room, there are some flyers as well. That also means that the flyers in the room that also means that this is at a discounted price. Anyway, so enough of me, and I hand over to Professor Paul Weller. Okay, well, thank you, Anthony. Um, the ghostly presence or whatever <laughs> off left. Um, but it's a particular pleasure uh, for me this evening to. Uh, welcome Emeritus Professor Michael Taylor uh, to speak to us and to open up then hopefully our discussion and engagement around the, the theme of Christians and dialogue. Um, I'm especially grateful to, to Michael for having agreed to do this. Um, I'll say two things about him. Um, <laughs> he Are they both the true? Or... <laughs> One is... Uh, that there are some of us who stand in the Christian tradition that talk a lot of fluff around it. With Michael, you won't get fluff around what he has to say to you. He will speak clearly, sharply, and in, you know, in a way that's challenging to all of us, I think. And the second is a small personal note of indebtedness because um, in kind of my life story, when I tried to be engaged in interfaith dialogue, things and um, worked to the creation of uh, the multi-faith center at the University of Derby. Michael was particularly encouraging and facilitative um, of some financial resources which helped towards that. And I want to acknowledge that publicly and thank him uh, for that. So for me, it's a personal joy and pleasure uh, that Michael should speak tonight, but also as part of this series where we're trying to not talk in the abstract about Christianity or Christianities and dialogue, but Christians and dialogue or Muslims and dialogue, humanists and dialogue. Um, and that's what our aim is in this, to bring that together um, from the various individual presentations and our discussions together and then um, on the 9th um, of June into a colloquium where all the presenters will engage with each other's presentation um, and then feeding into a publication, a special edition of the Journal of Dialogue Studies, which is an open access journal, so will be freely available to all of you uh, that will come out in the autumn um, of this year. And we'll have the substance of what the individual presenters have presented, but modified in the light of their debate and their discussion um, with one another. So thank you for coming. And Michael, thank you very much for agreeing to do this. And we put ourselves now in your hands. Uh, thank you, Paul. <clears throat> Good to see Paul. Um, three quick defensive remarks before I begin. One I've called it an opinion piece uh, because it lacks two dimensions that any serious paper I assume should contain. One is a serious look at what other literature there is on the subject, which I have not done. And the second is to look at the history of Christians and dialogue, which I also have not done. 
And there are two reasons for that. One is that Paul came to me far too late for it to be done. And secondly, I wasn't particularly inclined to do it. So that's mm -hmm. just being honest. Uh, the second one is, so it's an opinion piece. The second one is I am going to subject you to reading a formal paper. And that's because when I started to think about it, I realized I hadn't really thought about this subject very much. So I need to be rather careful about what I say. And I'm not so at home in this field as, for example, last week's uh, very experienced contributor was. He could talk with ease and knowledge and experience of the subject. I don't think I'm in that position. Uh, and the only third one is I'm, I'm conscious that um, I think sort of taking a bit of the respect about dialogue, that what I have to say will, for some of you, take you on very unfamiliar territory just as I hope when we listen to others, I'll be taken onto unfamiliar territory. Um, I can only sort of say, I hope you survive. And I've tried to make it as clear as I can, but I get a bit deep into my own particular interests and nuances at certain points. So um, here we go with um, Christians and dialogue. Uh, Christianity's traditional self-understanding does not bode well for dialogue although its founder knew quite a bit about it. Christianity proclaims a revealed truth about an incarnate God who sacrifices himself in order to meet the demands of justice and defeat man's greatest enemies of sin and death. His resurrection demonstrates his victory. Reparation having been made, our sins can now be forgiven and the way is cleared to eternal life. This truth is superior to all other claims to truth. It is fixed and final and universal in that it is true for everyone and everything, everywhere and in all times. It inspires and justifies imperial ambitions and missionary endeavors in the name of love as well as truth and aims to convert or colonize the whole world. The chorus to George Kitchen's stirring 19th century hymn, still sung in many churches, I think without a lot of thought, just about sums it up. Lift high the cross, the love of Christ proclaim, till all the world adore his sacred name. On the one hand, this hymn was written for a missionary society, Society for the Preparation of the Gospel, whilst on the other hand, it was said to be inspired by the conversion of Constantine the Great when he saw the sign of the cross in the sky with the familiar words, in this sign you will conquer, and when the love and adoration of the hymn was rapidly turned into power and obedience. Understood in this triumphalist way, Christianity is not genuinely open to dialogue, only to efforts to understand the other, present its own case, and note the similarities and differences. The picture, when painted in quieter terms, fits well with many an image of so-called interfaith dialogue. In the academic world, in my student days, it was known as comparative religion, later to become religious studies. Beyond that, interfaith encounters look more like proselytism persuading people of other religious faiths and none to come up higher, as it were, and convert to Christianity. Number two, things look more promising once we accept that Christianity, along with all religious and secular convictions, including scientific assumptions, are human constructs. Religions may talk about the divine, but they are inevitably human. They are made up by women and men. Even the insistence that, for example, they are not made up by women and men, but are revealed or given to them by God, is itself a human construct. It cannot be otherwise. This is not to say that those who believe these constructs are strangers to the truth, whatever the truth may be. Their beliefs, for example, may be faithful to their experience and to their observations of life around and within them. They may be true to what they call the facts. They may command wide agreement. They may be enduring as if to prove their validity. Accepting religious traditions as human constructs, whether ours or another's, is not to dismiss them as arbitrary, as if anything goes and we sink into the worst forms of relativism. 
At best, they are serious about truth. They remain, however, human and so share our human characteristics, such as the way we are affected by circumstances, what we believe to be the facts, our cultures, and our self-interest. And where such contingencies change, our beliefs are likely to change as well, whether we are in accepting or resisting mode. Number three, examples of this are not surprisingly everywhere. And here are a few that for various reasons come to my own mind. Early Christianity dramatically changed its tune from being a messianic crusade to a salvation myth for cultural and political reasons as it moved out into the Roman greco roman world. It drastically changed its tune again in South America in the 20th century and began to talk about liberation when its eyes were finally opened to the endemic poverty and oppression to which the church had acquiesced. From the Enlightenment onwards, science taught it to radically rethink its teaching about creation and what Christianity had taken to be God's permission to exploit it. A shift from hierarchies to democracies also began to creep in. It was economics that broke through the refusal of many Christians to believe that black people were human beings, so justifying both slavery and apartheid. Psychology, among other things, challenged Christianity's taste for penal practices, whether in courts or confessionals. So-called secularization, undaunted by religious authorities, erodes what seems unassailable attitudes to sex, marriage, and sexuality. Everywhere we can see new knowledge, self-interest, cultural shifts, political nous, historic and social circumstances, hard at work, giving Christianity second thoughts. They do not determine the outcomes, but they do influence them. One might be tempted to say that in this ongoing interplay, we can recognize some of the most profound and significant examples of dialogue. Number four, once Christians are clear about the human terms on which they consciously enter into dialogue, and that in that sense, at least, there is a level playing field where humanity meets humanity, calling for modesty and respect on all sides. What sort of dialogue are we talking about? For me, it is probably not the stereotypical interfaith dialogue, which I can find interesting and enlightening, but not very productive beyond that. At worst, it can feel like a talking shop. The desire to talk in the first place presumably goes back beyond curiosity to the desire to overcome division, if not difference, and build constructive relationships. In which case, the more productive approach may not, perversely, be to put the focus on faith or faiths at all. Religious or otherwise, comparing and contrasting them. Instead, the focus is not initially on faith, and what we do not share, but on the human interests and issues that we already have in common. Here are some examples from my own experience which seem to point in that direction. They are all examples of building relationships across dividing lines by talking together about shared issues and working together to resolve them. In so doing, the point of talking about issues of faith, if at all, becomes clearer and more purposeful. Dialogue, if you like, is contextualized. <coughs> Example A, the St. Philip's Centre in Leicester, of which I was a trustee for a time, was set up in 2006 by the Anglican Diocese, initially under the leadership of Andrew Wingate, already well known for his involvement in interfaith relations, both in India and Europe. From the outset, the center had an interest, a stated interest in educating churches about the other faith communities in their cities. Courses, including visits to mosques and temples, were provided for local congregations and still continue at the time of writing. For all their importance, such courses could fail to connect with what was happening not inside but outside places of worship. 
Leicester was one of the first cities, as you know, in the UK, where so-called ethnic minority groups were becoming the majority. The shift was accompanied by rising social tensions aggravated by familiar social issues, including racism, deprivation, unemployment, and lack of opportunity. No one suggested that religious differences were not part of the myth, but tackling them head on did not seem to be the best way of addressing what was needed. As a result, the center reframed its work under the strap line, learning to live well together. In practice, it meant everything from enabling members of multi-ethnic local communities to become friends rather than strangers, to dealing with some very serious problems, including violence and abuse that all of them face. At one end of a whole spectrum of activities supported by the center was the allocation of relatively modest grants from government to fund local initiatives <coughs> like street parties and playgroups. But at the other end was a highly contentious issue. The government's prevent program was designed to prevent young people and young men in particular from being radicalized in the wake of 9-11. Although in theory it was directed at all young people, the Muslim community felt it was particularly targeted at them and so greeted it with hostility. The elected Lord Mayor of Leicester did not wish to manage the program, possibly for political reasons such as losing the substantial vote of the Muslim community and asked the center to do so on his behalf. Against doing so was the risk of destroying the good relations and trust built up between the center and large sections of the diverse Muslim community. In favor was the plain fact that here was a problem that had to be faced and that the center was perhaps best placed to deal with it without making matters worse. After some very difficult debates, the center agreed to the mayor's request. And its very able deputy director, himself a Muslim, managed the prevent program along with a second member of staff working with the home office. This dialogue, so to speak, was about learning to live well together in very difficult circumstances. Within this and other initiatives, conversations about faith inevitably arose but in a way relevant to the context of a community's life. B, the World Faith Development Dialogue, of which I was director for a few years from 2001, offers a very different example. It was set up by James Wolfenson, then director of the World Bank, and George Carey, then Archbishop of Canterbury. For a number of years, it had only one paid staff member and then two, and then a grandiose scheme, which never materialized, thank God, to employ many more on a budget stretching to millions of dollars. Its aims were obvious. Recognizing the considerable influence of faith leaders internationally, nationally, and locally, it set out to encourage them with funding and other forms of support to work together to tackle poverty worldwide. Activities could range from large high-level international meetings attended by Wolfenson and Carey and government representatives such as Claire Short, the UK's Minister for International Development and her counterparts in other countries, to small-scale efforts to work with faith communities on the ground. One such effort involved enabling marginalized mixed faith groups in Africa to contribute effectively to government development policies. Conferences were also held between practitioners to share experience. The curious feature of this interfaith dialogue as I observed it was that at all levels, it rarely, if ever, in my experience, involved dialogues about faith as such. I attended and spoke to a session of the Parliament of the World's Religions in Barcelona but here and elsewhere, the talk was almost always about development and how to cooperate in ways that really made a difference between destitution and a decent standard of living, between disease and health, ignorance and education, insecurity and safety, but not about faith. C, to come to a third example, Christian AIDS activities could strike an equally curious note. <clears throat> 
Apart from the Roman Catholic Church, Christian Aid is the ecumenical agency or development arm of all the churches in Britain and Ireland. It was, obviously, it was often accused, e.g. by people on the doorstep during the annual connection in Christian Aid Week, of only helping Christians or of being a missionary movement on the lookout for converts. In fact, it was always careful to distance itself from the missionaries, sometimes to their great annoyance, and was always keen to support and work with people of all religious faiths and none, alongside its responsibility to encourage its churches around the world to engage in development work. My first ever visit overseas as director was to a Muslim organization in Bangladesh. But what was curious was that an overtly faith-based organization rarely, if ever, engaged in interfaith discussions about faith, either between the different Christian confessions it represented <coughs> or between Christians and other religious believers. Instead, discussions were about the practicalities and funding of faith-based efforts to tackle together the plight of refugees and the poor. We had our differences, of course, but differences over faith did not apparently get in the way, a point to which I shall return. D. Christian aid can be seen as part of a wider ecumenical Christian movement represented in the UK by councils of churches, national and local, and internationally by the World Council of Churches based in Geneva. At its heart was always the desire to build better relations between various Christian traditions, which had grown apart, Roman, <coughs> Orthodox and Protestant, and within Protestantism its own divisive tendencies. An interconfessional rather than interfaith dialogue, you might say, though as time went on, it broadened its understanding of ecumenical to involve other faith encounters. Interestingly, and relevant to my argument, it gained a great deal of its early impetus from some very practical challenges. One was the realization among missionary societies that they should stop competing with one another in the field, so exporting their confessional divisions in the process and negotiate ways to avoid it. Another was the refugee crisis following the Second World War, first in Europe and then in Palestine and the need to respond to the plight of so many across the political and ecclesiastical divides. That was when interchurch aid was born, a precursor of the World Council of Churches. As this movement developed in Geneva, two rather different but complementary approaches emerged and became known as faith and order and life and work. Faith and order looked like the more traditional form of interfaith dialogue, though, as has been said, it was interconfessional. The admirable aim was to remove doctrinal barriers to a united Christian community, which the world might then take seriously when it came to reconciliation, for example, an aim that was captured in the oft-quoted words of John's Gospel, may they all be one that the world might believe. A much discussed article of faith within this faith and order movement was the so-called filioque clause in the creed, declaring that the Holy Spirit proceeded from the Father and the Son. Whether it was true and whether it should be there or not there were issues which divided East and West. A familiar topic under order was the various orders of ministry of the church, such as bishops, priests, and deacons, with their authenticity passed down or otherwise from the apostles. In other words, who could be accepted as ordained and who could not? The most well-known achievement of various faith and order commissions was a document known as BEM, or Baptism, Eucharist and Ministry, published in 1982, which in many quarters certainly eased tensions between the churches. Life and work, on the other hand, took a very different approach and focused much more on the different confessions working together on issues including peace and reconciliation, economics, apartheid, racism, social justice, refugees and international development. The whole enterprise looked less like interfaith dialogue 
and more like conversations and cooperation around shared human issues. Now, it would be difficult to say which of the two arms of the WCC has contributed most to the unity of the churches. The broad picture within the Christian community has not changed all that much. There are few outstanding examples of churches uniting, and even the most well known the Church of South India, in places like Sri Lanka, functions as another denomination alongside the rest. And its ministry is not everywhere accepted, even by the churches which created it. In any case, the taste for a structurally united church may well have faded and was never really shared by the more evangelical churches. My point here, however, is a different one. In 2015, I traced the story of the debate about capitalism amongst the churches involved with the WCC in the ecumenical movement. I was not looking for it, but I was bound to note that as the debate went on, its participants were gradually understanding unity, less in terms of what they did or still did not believe together, and more in terms of what they agreed to do together about in this particular case, the economic order, which rewarded relatively few and oppressed so many. In other words, if dialogue had to do with overcoming unhelpful, even damaging divisions and building constructive relationships, the focus was shifting from discussing what people believed to how they could cooperate to modify capitalism's worst effects and build a more just and sustainable economic order. Not only was unity being found in active cooperation rather than in theological debate, it was the context within which discussions around faith came alive and the church came to be defined as standing with Jesus of Nazareth, for example, on the side of the poor. The direction of travel was so noticeable that those who opposed it dismissed it as a decline into social activism and away from rigorous theological thinking, or what we might call in this context, into confessional dialogue. And the search for church unity is originally understood. So to summarize so far, I've expressed doubts, and of course I'm not alone in this, about traditional approaches to interfaith dialogue and declared a bias towards cooperation on shared human issues. Where matters of faith arise, their relevance will be recognized and they will be better addressed in that context of common concern. That having been said, there remain plenty of issues discussed, of which I will move on to mention four. Number five. First, a rather obvious point, but also always worth remembering. When, for whatever reason, we do get into conversations about one another's faiths, preferably, as I have said, within the context of shared endeavors, what we are confronted with are not lifeless words on a page or propositional truths or ideas which only require us to understand what they mean. Because these ideas are man-made, they are alive and infused with the many different factors which have helped to fashion them. As we listen, explain and respond, we are dealing not only with words, but with people's histories, cultures, personalities, good and bitter experiences and self-interests. They may not all be relevant to any particular dialogue, but we should be aware that they might be and that some definitely will be. I was struck by a recent example. I've been involved in an interesting dialogue hosted to some extent by this institution between Western and Chinese scholars. It was not an interfaith dialogue, though faiths, including Confucianism, certainly came into the picture. Rather, it was about the criminal justice system and how to make it more humane, to heal rather than hurt even more, and to improve matters rather than make matters worse. It involved explaining different viewpoints, practices, and experiences. On one occasion, a Chinese participant explained what a Western participant regarded as a disappointingly half-hearted 
even misguided approach and criticized him heartily for it, completely forgetting the constraints imposed on him by the dominant culture and the domineering political regime in his own country. Again, highly conservative statements about homosexuality, for example, can represent a deep hinterland, not just of faith, but of culture and even concerns for survival. It is not just a matter of debating what is said, but of being sensitive to the human complexities involved when people speak and what might be called the density of the words that they use. A very different reminder of the same point came on a visit to Africa under the auspices of the World Faith Development Dialogue. When a number of faith groups refused to engage with one another over tackling the deprivations <coughs> they all shared, the stumbling block turned out to be not the faith divides between them as such, but what those faiths had come to represent. They had become icons of long histories of ethnic conflict and mistrust. Six, to turn to a second issue, where faith communities learn to live well together as they cooperate around shared human interests, the Christian faith certainly has a contribution to make, but it cannot, with that old imperial touch, rule the roost. It can claim no privileges in the marketplace of ideas. Its faith insights are of two kinds. Some will sound like statements of what is the case. Others will sound more like value statements. <clears throat> An example of the first runs right through Christian history and is signaled by words like sin and original sin. There is a deep fault in human nature. Traditionally, it has been thought of as some sort of disobedience to God's benevolent commands and going deeper still, the inherited tendency to do so from birth. I would not wish to describe it in those terms but instead in terms of our endemic fragility and insecurity as human beings, which drive us towards self-interested and self-protected behavior at the expense of other people. For all our capacity for love and generosity, we will behave badly. And according to Reinhold Niebuhr, the outstanding Christian social theologian of the 20th century, even more so when we get together in our tribes. Christians will therefore insist that failing to take account of this indelible human characteristic will lead to disastrous social arrangements. The discipline of Christian social ethics called Christian realism. Had more attention been paid to it in a Brexit debate, for example, the evident discontent and over immigration in some communities might well have been avoided. Examples of value statements, rather than statements of what is the case, are numerous and include, of course, disinterested love, empathy, acceptance, forgiveness, justice, and so on. If not unique to Christianity, they are certainly upheld by it, at least in theory. In each case, Christians are saying, in effect, that upholding them will improve the quality of our lives. Interfaith and inter-ethnic communities have to find common ground if they are to cooperate. They need a degree of common understanding of what they are dealing with and some shared values when they respond. And in the case of values, we come up against the somewhat academic discussion about their justification as to how far we need to agree about it. In other words, why is something like empathy or justice or equality a good thing? And whether an ought has to have its roots in an is, because morals are necessarily grounded in faith. Put bluntly, bluntly, can a value such as equal respect survive once cut loose from some sort of faith statement, such as man is made in the image of God? and our ethics, therefore, inevitably theological ethics. Take away the ideology and you uproot the value. A debate of this sort emerged in the rivalry between faith and order and life and work in the World Council of Churches, 
where one slogan proclaimed that doctrine divides and service unites. It correctly reflected the experience that it was easier to cooperate on practical issues than to agree about doctrine. But it incorrectly suggested that, that no theological issues, including the divisive ones, arise when we do cooperate. Apartheid became a glaring example with the need, as Desmond Tutu once said, that for Christians needed to find a new anthropology, a new ideology, or shall we say, new roots. If values must have their reasons, roots, one thing Christians cannot do in the market square is to suggest that certain values must be upheld for reasons tied to their own particular Christian faith. That is what I mean by ruling the roost or claiming privilege. Ideally, in an interfaith, including non-religious faith context, the common ground would include both shared values and the shared reasons for upholding them. For example, to return to the reality of self-interested behavior in the face of insecurity, Christians may find a rationale for taking it seriously in their faith, and others may or may not do likewise in relation to theirs. But everyone might find it in the common recognition that no one is perfect and there is good and bad in us all. Or when it comes to a commitment, say, to empathy, it may well be inspired for Christians by traditional teaching about incarnation and the deep immersion of a God in human experience. Whilst everyone, including Christians, might see how valuable it is because of our human need to be understood. Yet another approach following Aristotle upholds certain values, not because of faith, but as contributing to commonly agreed goals. In these and other cases, the common ground can be fairly deep, recognized by the religious and the secular, where Christians do not expect others to move onto their faith territory if they are to work with them. Insights drawn from faith are offered, but theological imperialism is set aside in the search for the common good. One or two further considerations can also be of help when fostering this common ground that is needed for cooperation. For example, intuition may play a part where is widespread recognition of a value without feeling the need to go into the reasons why. And there's a moral theory which is rather keen on this, uh, reference Kant, whilst others treat it with some caution. Or again, it seems possible for people to share values, but for very different reasons. They set out, if you like, from different starting points, but arrive at much the same destination. Another version of the same point is the familiar discovery in early forays into comparative religion of values common to all, most obviously the commandment to love your neighbor as yourself or do unto others as you would be done to. Number seven. The third of my four further considerations take us back, and here I apologize somewhat, into my own particular interests, namely social ethics and social theology. It concerns the necessary gap between theology and social policy. You cannot go directly from one to the other or characterize an actual detailed policy as Christian, apart from it being promoted by Christians who presumably regard it as at least compatible with their faith. At local and national levels, faith communities, along with others in this country, will share an interest in policy issues, such as social care, leveling up, and immigration, to name but three. We have already indicated that a faith like Christianity has a contribution to make to these discussions, but it can only get us so far. One school of Christian social, social ethics suggested it was as far as what they called middle axioms or halfway houses, i.e. between the faith and the policy. One example they quoted was full employment, which they saw as required by Christian beliefs about human beings and their dignity. 
which could not nevertheless say how it should be achieved. Another way to talk about theology's limits would be to call them important generalities, such as the direction in which any social policy should lean, equality, for example, in the case of social care, or generosity in the case of immigration, and realism in the case of both. They take us so far, but by no means all the way. Many other mediating disciplines and insights are needed, including those, for example, of economics, sociology, healthcare, administration, if any policy is going to be workable and make any sense. At this point, apart from the broad guidelines referred to Christianity, Christianity has nothing to say. It has to come to terms with these largely autonomous disciplines. As a faith, it does not know, for example, how best to take care of elderly people or find the necessary funding, whether from borrowing on international markets or taxation, or how to organize a healthcare or immigration system any more than it can advise a doctor on which medicines to use. Economists, sociologists, administrators, politicians, scientists, and all others will have the greatest say. The argument is much the same when it comes to education, for example. At the local level, where different faith communities might try to organize a preschool playgroup, Christianity does not know how best to run a school trained educationalists do. In many ways, these limitations to what Christianity can contribute, together with the autonomy of secular disciplines, and the necessary gap between theology and social policy is helpful to interfaith cooperation on shared human issues. Faith can show the way without getting in the way. A large measure of agreement, even total agreement about a policy, can be found on grounds largely independent of faith. In 2005, I looked into the practice of social theology in Christianity and Islam, admittedly in a very preliminary way. It occurred to me that Islam might not be so keen on this gap as I am. In Islam, faith statements seem much more likely to translate directly into social policy than in my Christianity. The starting point for one thing is very different. Not a Galilean with no real political power, but a prophet who having fled to Medina immediately set up an Islamic state with a constitution on the basis of a directly revealed message. Here, there is apparently no distance between theology and social policy at all. Many Muslim scholars, however, as far as I understand it, accept the need for mediating disciplines and of course, have had a wonderful track record in the sciences. They understand the need for mediating disciplines and my understanding of creative reasoning in Islam or Ijtihad suggests that there is plenty of room for different interpretations and ways of applying the guidance of faith. For example, on just how to build an economy which meets the Islamic requirements of avoiding usury and offering equal opportunities for all. Once again, we're not just dialoguing with words on a page, but confronting the history and circumstances and interests of those who formulated them. Number eight. One further consideration in conclusion, and this has to do with power. Under the auspices of the World Face Development Dialogue, and then the Department for International Development, funded research programs on religions and development. I worked with mixed faith rural communities in Nigeria and Tanzania. These communities were involved mainly as farmers with their governments in dialogues or consultations over future agricultural policies a shared human issue, whatever faith they held. Not surprisingly, the farmers had very strong opinions and were not always in agreement with government officials. Their opinions, however, were not being taken seriously 
because they were not able to present them in a form which officialdom regarded as acceptable. A similar situation occurred at a meeting in Tanzania I attended between IMF officials and local people, again over farming policies, where the contributions of the locals, which might be thought to be the most interesting and relevant, were dismissed by the officials as purely anecdotal. As a result, in both cases, the farmers were in dialogue, but without the power to be heard. Issues of power also arose around ecumenical round tables sponsored by the WCC. Faith-based NGOs like Christian Aid from North and South would sit together, supposedly as equals, to share resources, not all of the material, and discuss how best to support local projects. The North, however, held the purse strings. And even more significant was the fact that most of their money came in turn from Western governments, with very firm conditions as to how it should be spent, and more annoyingly, how it should be accounted for. When real differences occurred, it was the funders who finally called the tune. To return to the farmers in Nigeria and Tanzania, this was not a matter of funding, but of influencing policy making. It was about people who were not taken seriously in the dialogue, a scenario too easily replicated nearer to home. We were able to take at least one step towards rebalancing power by helping these intelligent, knowledgeable, but uneducated people to get their arguments down on paper in a sufficiently cogent way for officialdom to regard them as competent and so take note of what they had to say along with all the other well-presented submissions from more articulate groups. The project was called Strengthening the Voice of the Poor, Capacity for Participation in Policy Processes. In all these shared endeavors and dialogues, there can be imbalances of power from the personal to the corporate, which call for awareness and where possible, correction. In this paper, I have expressed a preference for dialogues between Christians and people of other faiths within the context of shared human issues. I've looked at some of the sensitivities that should surround those dialogues and at what Christians can and cannot contribute. I have shied away from the more traditional forms of interfaith dialogue, or to be fair, from my own experiences of them. If I had to give further reasons for doing so, I might point out to how much wider and inclusive those dialogues in context then become, drawing in those from left and right of whatever faith or worldview who would otherwise never take part. But I might also return again to the issue of power. It is most likely to raise its head when the dialogue or negotiation touches on what really matters to the participants and affects their welfare. And since it does not seem to arise in any serious extent in exchange of views about faith as such, I am tempted to see them as academic exercises where nothing very serious is at stake. If faith does have a part to play, it may be in coming to our aid when religion gets in the way of our humanity and the common good, and by doing their best to move us on. And the issue of power is very different, if I may say so. It's in stark contrast to those other forms of dialogue in the worlds of diplomacy, industrial relations, and peacemaking. The general drift of my comments in this paper on Christians and dialogue may well explain how much I warmed to the fevered outcry of an international Sikh leader at a World Faith Development Assembly. He was either frustrated or excited by the conversation, or maybe both, and I've long remembered his words. Humanity first, religion second. You've escaped. Well, thank you very much, Michael. Um, you started off by um, 
explain why you didn't think you should do this, <laughs> uh, um, but you have in, uh, 